This is Case Closed, Crime Stories from the Golden Age of Radio. Murder by Expert. Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world-famous mystery novelist whose books have been translated into 17 languages and have sold over 10 million copies and author of the recently published detective novel, Below Suspicion. Good evening. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery writer, Miss Helen Riley. From her vast knowledge of the field of mystery, Miss Riley has selected a fast-moving taut drama by Maurice Zim. And now we present William Zuckert in Return Trip. Our scene, a small, plainly furnished hospital room, late at night. The patient, a man in his late thirties, is flat on his back, staring up with pain-filled eyes at the ceiling. He raises his head slowly as the door to his room is opened. Nurse? Yes, there's someone to see you. Yeah? This is Superintendent Andrews of the State Institution. Oh, what have, what have you got there? I've uh, set up a recording machine out in the hall. Careful with the wire, nurse, when you close the door. The doctor said not to keep him. Yes, I'll make it as brief as possible. You may go now, nurse. Very well. Do you uh, mind if I hook this microphone at the head of the bed? Suit yourself, fella. Well, it was a choice between a recording machine and a stenographer, and I figured that in your condition... I... Well, who said I was beefing? Go on, ask. Ask your questions. I have only one question. What happened? You mean I... I can tell this in my own way? <laughs> That's great. Had an uncle once, you know, that was a writer. He wouldn't have gone near this kind of a story, though, with a ten-foot pen. No, he went in for happy endings. <laughs> Uncle Mort wouldn't either even have liked the beginning of this story. It was kind of dreary-like up there at the asylum that afternoon. There'd been quite a snowfall the week before, and as far as the eye could see, everything was a dirty gray, like a, like a corpse that's been waiting too long for the undertaker. Well, around four o'clock, it got so dark, the lights had to be turned on in the institution. Then the wind started moaning like a lonely banshee. Fine day for a murder, as the fellow said. Well, there were three passengers sitting in the bus when I went outside for the return trip. Two men and a woman. Maybe I ought to call her a girl, because she wasn't much more than that. Anyway, these three passengers all had return tickets, and I went down the aisle collecting. Driver, how soon do we start? Right away, miss. We're two minutes late already. These little jerkwater bus lines never keep you their schedules. Now we'll never get out of these mountains before that blizzard lets loose. Can I have your ticket, please, mister? You really think there'll be a storm? Can't fail. Lady, when they have snow up in these godforsaken mountains. Now, this morning on the bus coming up... A man was telling me about the time... The windbag was sitting right across the aisle from the girls, second row from the front. Halfway back in the bus sat the third passenger, all huddled up in his overcoat. He didn't open his trap. 
Well, that was the picture as we swung out onto the highway for the return trip. And this guy in back of me seemed to be itchy to start a conversation with somebody as soon as we got rolling. Might as well get acquainted, miss. Fifty miles before we get to civilization. John Willard's the name. I said... Oh, I beg your pardon. Were you speaking to me? Oh, yes. I'm afraid I was thinking of... Oh, sure. Sure, these visits to the institution, always depressing, aren't they? This is my first time. Oh, some friend? My... my husband. Oh, that's too bad. I, uh, I hope... What's that? Some kind of siren. Yeah, that's the, uh, asylum alarm, all right. Well, that means he... One of the inmates must be playing hide-and-seek with the keepers. That happens every once in a while. Gosh, what if it's my brother? Oh, is he the busting out kind? Oh, it sort of upsets him to see one of the family, but then if we don't come to see him, it upsets him even more. I see what you mean. Do they always catch them? Well, they tell me the place has never lost a customer yet. A moment ago, I was praying that it wasn't Jim. But now I... Don't know, even if they had to. Well, it it would be better than seeing him as he was today. Anything would would be better than seeing him. Hey, that's a police siren. Sounds like they're almost on top of us. Yeah, there they are. Look out, they're going to pass us. There's nothing. They're flagging me down. All right, now just keep your seats, everybody. Guards. With rifles. We're looking for somebody. Uh, yeah, we heard the asylum alarm and... Seen uh, anyone along the road? No, not even a jackrabbit. Officer, who is it you... Greg, Steve Greg. Oh. That's a relief. Polly, take yourself a walk down the aisle. Keep your rifle ready when you look behind those back seats. Are you kidding? Hey, uh, when was this... Coming out party. I don't know. Maybe as much as a couple of hours ago. Oh. Does this Greg have a gun? I can't guarantee he hasn't. But it was a file that sprung him. A tiny steel file. Must have been working away at the bar since the day he was committed. A month ago. His day was short. Nobody back here. Now check the gents for identification. I know how it is, driver. Can't take chances. Well, of course not. Uh, here's mine. Okay. I didn't really mean that. Your name, no, Frank Keniston? You can read, can't you? Friendly cuss, ain't you? You know, that's the first peep that passenger has let out. I was beginning to think he was a deaf mute. Yeah. Well, here, driver, you can have the stuff back. Oh, thanks. What about you, mister? It's okay, Holly. His name's John Willard. I checked his identification. Okay, Doc. Come on, then. Let's cram. We got to find Greg before he finds anybody. Yeah. Driver, you can turn around and go back. Go back? Go back why? Look, this Greg is a killer. A ruthless, senseless killer. What I mean is, when the mood strikes him, he strikes. Oh. What's that got to do with us turning back? Didn't I tell you this guy kills even without reason? Now he's got plenty of reason. He's got to get out of these mountains, but quick. If he's down the road, there are a lot of ways he could stop a bus. I say turn back. But that blizzard's liable to break any minute. We could be snowbound up here for days. If I had to spend even one night in that institution, so help me, they'd have to keep me there. Listen, driver. Now, just a second, Mr. Willard. You're just one passenger. There are three. What about you, miss? Well... Whatever you say. Uh, Mr. Uh, Keniston? I say keep going. That settles it. Hurry up, Dan. No, wait. Uh, uh, what does this killer Greg look like? Mm, height about 5 feet 10. Weight about 165. Dark hair, brown eyes, 37 years old. Dent, get the lead out of your britches. But I still think they We to... warned them, didn't we? Now, if they meet up with them, it's their funeral. Yeah. Well, we can take care of ourselves, fellas. Well, after the guards left, I really set that bus to rolling. Out of the mirror up above the driver's seat, I could see that the girl was plenty scared, but she had nerve, I'll say that for her. Willard, the windbag across the aisle from her, gave up trying to draw her into a conversation. And as for the third passenger, Keniston, sitting halfway toward the back, he kept acting like a clam afraid of losing its oyster. Might as well have had lockjaw, if you get what I mean. 
Well, we hadn't gone more than another mile or two before the wind started to rise. Kept it up until you'd have thought all the devils in hell were trying to break loose. Got black as the inside of a tomb until the snow started to fall. But with that wind whipping it around, it didn't exactly fall. It was a real howling blizzard. This is getting on my nerves. What have we got here anyway? A collection of zombies? Somebody say something. I was uh, just going to say... You were going to say the weather is rotten. Yeah, and she can say that again. No, that isn't what I was going to say. No? Hurrah. That'll give us two topics of conversation. We'll save the weather for later. Well, go ahead, lady. I can't think of a better antidote for the screaming Mimi's right now than your voice. Uh, it occurred to me why the guards asked for identification. Yeah? The description of Killer Greg. Five foot ten, 165 pounds. Dark hair, brown eyes, 37 years old. So what? It's a remarkable thing. That description would fit you, Mr. Willard. Oh? And Mr. Keniston. What's that? Me? And, for, for that matter, the driver. Say, now look. We... Hey, come to think of it, all three of us could fit that description. So could a million other men. Forget it. Forget it. Keniston, what's eating you anyway? First you sit back there like a mummy, then when you finally do one... I don't happen to feel like talking. Yeah? Well, personally, the more I think of what she said, the more remarkable it becomes. Yeah. She's got something there. Only remarkable isn't the word. Mr. Willard, what are you thinking? This man, Greg, may be insane, but he's not dumb. Oh, no. Put yourself in his place. He knows he hasn't got a ghost of a chance making his getaway in that hospital clothing, see? So he borrows the wardrobe and identification of some stranger. You follow me? We're way ahead of you, Willard. It wouldn't be difficult for a killer. Say not. But that still isn't the end of his problem, see? He's fighting against time. He's got to get out of these godforsaken mountains down to civilization before they can throw a noose around the whole area. And he knows that if he's brought back alive, he'll be wearing a straitjacket until he's as old as Methuselah. Well, you've got quite an imagination, Willard. Thanks. Now, the odds that Greg will be able to get himself transportation are mighty slim, except for this bus line. So let's suppose... Yeah, you got a great imagination, all right. You got it all figured out. It's a bit too pad, if you ask me. Remember, please, you're the one who was so dead set against turning back. Really, Keniston? Well, I'll leave it to the lady here and the driver. Do I look insane? Well? Search me. There were times, long periods of time, when Jim didn't either. It's my husband, I mean. That was the terrible part of it. He, he would be just like the old days, and we'd be so happy together, and then all of a sudden, without warning, he... It's keriston has been acting crazy, not me. I'll bet it wouldn't take a half a dozen psychiatrists to prove that he... Hey, an avalanche! It's coming down on us! Hold on! After the avalanche struck, I... I sat there, gripping the steering wheel, sort of... sort of stunned. And there wasn't a sound except for the wind. And it was muffled by the snow barrier that packed us in. Even on the far side, the bus was buried up to the middle of the windows. Well, all this was only a matter of seconds, I suppose. And then suddenly the quiet was broken by the most gosh-awful racket. It was as if somebody had up and given the signal for my passengers to go completely crazy. Get me out of here. Now, take it easy, will Get you? Get me out of here. Look out, Please. Willis got an axe. The axe. Go of it, will it? Let go of that axe. That's it. He's the one. He's the one. Lucky I saw him grab the fire axe from up on the rack. It's what the district attorney likes to call a, a lethal weapon. And then some. 
Step back. He's coming too. Yeah, tie him up. Yeah, you'll find a rope in the dashboard compartment. Get it for me, huh? Uh, driver, I'll report you for this. You will, huh? I was going to smash a window so we could get out of here. Oh, yeah? Sure. What'd you think? Oh, so that's it. Here's a rope, driver. Thanks. Here, you can't do that. You can't tie me up, you fools. I'm not killer, Greg. Maybe. Maybe, maybe he isn't. Maybe. But like the guard says, we can't take chances. Now, if you're innocent, Misty, you can prove it to the authorities. If we ever live that long. Have you forgotten that we're trapped here by an avalanche and a blizzard that could go on and on and on? Just the same. Stop, stop. This is ridiculous. What do you mean, miss? Well, it's just that there's no proof that Killer Greg is on this bus. Well, if you you put it that way, I... It's all my fault, and I'm very sorry. My only excuse is that I was so upset by seeing Jim, my husband. I still say that... No, no. We've got to start acting like rational human beings. You let poor Mr. Willard up from that floor. Thanks, lady. All right. But I'm warning you, Willard, no funny stuff. Oh, snap out of a driver. We've got to get out of this mess. Hand me that axe. Do I look that dumb? All right, then use it yourself. Smash a window so we can crawl out. Willard, what makes you think the windows won't open? Huh? Then open one. What for? To let in the blizzard? But we've got to get out of here. Not me. Take a bear to make even a city block in that blizzard. But we can't stay here. Why not? We're not freezing yet. Driver's right. Our best chance is to sit pat until the storm lets up. But what if it doesn't? If and when the weather clears, we can send out a party for help, huh? Yeah, or maybe a road clearing crew will come to our rescue. Yes. I, I suppose that's the sane thing to do. Wait here. Well, how about you, Willard? You also decided to do the same thing? I don't like that crack, Keniston. One more like it. Now, look, we're not starting that again. That's going to be a long night. We might just as well make ourselves comfortable and try to get some sleep. Sleep? Cut it out. Miss, you, uh, you take the back seat. That's the only one that runs the full width of the bus. You can use your lap robe for a quilt, huh? All right, driver. I, uh, want to apologize again to everyone for the way I behaved. Casting suspicion. Forget it, forget it. Need any help? No, no, thanks. I don't know what came over me starting that idiotic talk. Please believe... What? What's the matter? Why are you staring at the floor? Well, say something. Look. Look! A file. Tiny steel file. On the... T- After the avalanche hit, there was a mad scramble. One of you lost it then. One of you is... Greg. Killer Greg. Let me out of there! Let me out of there! Well, we just let her wear herself out, kicking and banging on the door. Nobody said a word. Willard and Keniston just stared at me and at each other. By and by, the girls stopped her fussing to stand and stare at the three of us in rotation. Would have made your flesh crawl. And outside, the blizzard was getting worse, if possible. Finally, I reached into the watch pocket of my pants and brought out the old timepiece. What... what time is it? Uh... broke the crystal, uh... Still says a quarter to four. It's 5.30. It's only an hour and a half since we started out. Only an hour and a half. 5.30 in the afternoon. And at the very best, we're stuck until morning. 14, 16 hours. Might as well be forever. Now, look, miss, we just got to make the best of it. I still think you ought to go back to the rear seat. And sleep? If you can, yeah. Willard, uh, the driver, and myself will be keeping a rather uh, close eye on each other in the light of recent developments. You'll be all right, especially if you take that axe away from the driver. Huh? Let her have it for her protection. Sure, let her have it. Yes, you give it to me. Okay. You uh, holding on to the file, too? Of course she is. 
The file could also be a lethal weapon. Well, she took the axe and the file back to the rear seat with her, and we all sat down to wait. Have you ever fought against sleep? With the cold numbing you and the wind lulling you? <laughs> you know, sometimes even the fear of sudden death can't win against those odds. Time and time again, the girl's eyes would close just for a second. And then they stayed closed longer, and her head nodded and her body slumped over against the corner of the seat. I got up and started down the aisle. Where you going? Shh, Keniston, can't you see she's asleep? Where are you going? Her lap robe slipped to the floor. I was going to pick it up and cover her so she wouldn't freeze. Any objections? I'll do it. Oh, no, you won't, Keniston. Go ahead, driver. Now you see, Keniston, Willard thinks I should do it. It makes it two to one. like a devil on a pinwheel. I was lucky to tear loose before she did any more than nick me about the face. Afterwards, when Willard told her what I was up to, she apologized, but I didn't go near her again all the rest of that night. Well, about five o'clock, the blizzard stopped, and at seven, the sun managed to break through. We held a council of war. We can't send out for help. Why not? Don't you see, Mr. Willard? If we split up the men, whichever of you is Greg, would have too good an opportunity. Whether he goes or stays. Well, you could go alone. I'd never make it. We could all go together. How about that, driver? Well, I'd, I'd rather stick with the bus, Keniston. But before we decide anything, let's get out and look around. We got a window open on the far side of the bus and crawled through. The girl first. She was still clutching the axe and the file. Come here and look. Another few yards and we'd have escaped the avalanche entirely. We can shovel our way out. I'm sure we can. Well, there were two shovels in the tool compartment at the tail guard of the bus. That only let two men shovel at a time with the third man getting a breather meanwhile. And it took a lot of shoveling. What's the matter, driver? Did you hurt your hand? Nothing much. Feels good just to take off these stiff leather gloves. Looks to me like uh, you've got some blisters on that right hand. Thumb and first two fingers. Say, Keniston, are you shoveling or talking? We'll never get out of here at this rate. Well, it's your turn anyway. I'm tired. Not as tired as Willard looks. I'll relieve him. No, no, no. That's all right. I I can keep going yet for a while. Okay, then, Keniston. Here. Let me take a turn. I know I won't be much help, but I, I can at least try. No, you're a mounting guard. I'm sure you could do as well as Kenneth. Where is Keniston? Why? <laughs> Keniston was making a mad dash through the snow. Willard dropped his shovel and tore after him. I yelled for Willard to let him go, but I don't think he even heard me. For a while, it looked like Keniston was going to make it, but then he floundered and fell in the snowdrift. And before he could get underway again, Willard nailed him. <laughs> You'll stay put for a while. What did you do? Knock him out? What else was there to do? Is he? Oh. I knew all the time it was Keniston. You think his running away proves it? It's the same as if he'd confessed. He knew it was his last and only chance. What, what are we going to do with him now? Tie him up. And we're getting him and the bus out of here. Say, I wonder if there's a reward. In no time at all, we had the bus clear and headed for civilization. Those snow-covered mountain roads weren't exactly my idea of a speedway, but I gave the motor the gun. Willard and the girl didn't take their eyes off Keniston. I kept watching him, too, out of the mirror over the driver's seat. Uh, he looks like he's coming, too. Don't worry, driver. Those knots I made on the rope won't give. Besides, I'm keeping the axe handy just in case. 
He's opening his eyes. Watch him now. Watch him. Yeah. Yeah, watch me. And listen to me, too. Shut up, Keniston, or I'll stop this bus and put you out for good. Not before I've had my say. Willard, you too, lady. Why do you think I tried to make a break for it? That's easy. You're killer, Greg. You fools. You blind, stupid fools. Was it my watch that had its crystal smashed at a quarter of four yesterday afternoon? So it was mine. So what? At a quarter of four yesterday afternoon, Killer Greg waylaid the real driver of this bus and took his place. What? Oh, no. That's how the crystal came to be broken. Shut up, Keniston. You can't talk your way out of it, this. It could be a coincidence. Sure. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. A coincidence. Until I noticed the blisters on the thumb and first two fingers of the right hand. A file would make blisters like that. A file held in the right hand of Killer Greg. Look at him. It's true. Greg. Greg. Don't come a step closer, any of you. You make the slightest move, I'll crash the whole lot of us. Don't do it, Greg. Stop the bus. We won't do anything. It was a perfect plan. It had to work. Oh, if only that avalanche hadn't come along. Well, I'll still make it. I'll still make it, even if I have to kill us. That turn! Look out for that train! <laughs> You got all I said on your on your recording machine, huh, Super? You got you, you got it all, huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm right back where I started from. The asylum. <laughs> anyway, I I outlived those three. <laughs> I outlived those three, didn't I, Super? <laughs> Killer Greg, that's me. <laughs> Killer Greg. <laughs> And so the curtain falls on Return Trip, which was chosen by guest expert Helen Riley, whose latest thriller is Staircase 4. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of a woman who awakened from a nightmare to find reality even more frightening, as selected for your approval by one of America's leading detective writers. Until then... This is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us next week at this time. Return Trip was written by Maurice Zinn. In our cast were William Zuckert, Ann Shepard, Roger DeCoven, Frank Behrens, and Alan Manson. Music in our program is under the direction of Emerson Buckley, composed by Richard DuPage. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. characters in this week's story were fictitious. Any resemblance to the names of actual persons living or dead was purely coincidental. This is Phil Tonkin speaking. This is the world's largest network serving more than 500 stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Kraft W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight you're going to meet some charming people. And you're going to run into a little bit of very fancy murder. The name of the story is Little Drops of Rain. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Did you know that there are over 50 million men in the United States who shave? Yes, that's a lot of men. It was in the interest of these 50 million shavers that Fitch Company chemists and technicians went to work in their laboratories and came up with Fitch's No Brush, a shaving cream especially designed to give a solid comfort shave. You see, Fitch's No Brush shaving cream contains not one, but three important shaving ingredients that work together to give you a smoother, faster shave. It also contains a special skin conditioner ingredient. Men appreciate this ingredient because it has a soothing effect on the skin the instant it's applied, and it keeps the skin feeling smooth and refreshed long after the shave is finished. Men also like the just-right consistency of Fitch's No Brush. It's neither too thick nor too thin. It's not greasy and won't clog the razor. If you're among those who prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives a rich, dense lather that wilts whiskers completely soft for clean, fast shaves. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in big 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try a jar. You'll find it easier on your razor and easier on you. Thank you, Jim. And now, I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. still confined to my little cranked up downy couch in the hospital, but not as still as I was last week. I am now allowed to get up and totter around a little, and I use the word totter advisedly. My legs act like strangers who have different political beliefs, and my knees have suddenly developed sideway hinges. But my nurses, ah, my nurses, yes, they're beautiful and tender, and resistant. And speaking of nurses, nurses are girls, and girls are my favorite pastime. And that brings me up to the girl who has done the most to confuse my life. Liza, the girl I was so sincerely in love with a couple of months ago. Liza was in to see me. She just left, and we were talking about the time when I showed up at her apartment for a date. It was raining out, and... I was sitting at the piano, doodling around a little bit. I don't want to go to a nightclub tonight, Richard. I'm too tired. Let's just go to a show, shall we? Anything you say, baby. That's the kind of guy I am. I want to see two girls and a sailor. It's playing at the Rialto. June Allison's in that, isn't she? Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's for me, then. You think so? Definitely. You think she's prettier than I am? Well, you, you're not in pictures, Angel. Do you think she's prettier than I am? Well, well you're, a, you're a different type. Are you going to answer me? Oh, 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 oh you're jealous. <laughs> How can you be jealous of a girl I don't even know? Give me a kiss. No. Oh, but baby, I love you. I love you like anything. Tiff. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Pop then. I don't care. Mm, June is busting out all over, all over the meadow and the hill. Busts are busting out of bushes, and the robin river pushes every little wheel that wheels beside a mill. June is busting out all over. The feeling is getting so intense. 
That the young Virginia creepers have been hugging the bejeepers Out of all the morning glories on the fence Because it's June, 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 June You're Just... insufferable, Richard Rogue Oh, now quit potting Come on over here, on the bench by me Are we going to a show or not? Sure. Get your lipstick on again and we'll see what... Oh. I'll get it. No, I'll answer. It's probably George. Oh, George. Well, I'll tell him, that homewrecker. Hello. Is Mr. Rogue there? Mm, Speaking. Uh, This is your call service, Mr. Rogue. We got a call for you. Oh, uh, oh. Who is it? Uh, uh, Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Says it's very important. Okay, put her on. Right. Oh, put her on. Who is it? Shh. Hello? Uh, Richard Rogue speaking. This is Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Yes? I must see you at once, Mr. Rogue. Oh, well, any time tomorrow, Mrs. Burgess. I must see you tonight, immediately. It is most important. Well, can't you tell me about it over the phone? Oh, no. Could you come to my house at once? Uh, What's the address? 485 Hillcrest. You'll be well paid for your time. Please hurry. I'll be right out, Mrs. Burgess. Wait for me. I'll be right back, honey. Go on. Go on out to see Mrs. Burgess. Don't mind me, Dick Tracy. Well, what could I do? Mrs. Harvey Burgess was the wife of a tycoon with a dollar for every Democrat in Georgia. I tried to explain to Liza, but I was talking to myself and I left for the Burgess residence. (laughs) I left Liza burning like Mrs. O'Leary's barn. The Burgess Mansion was a huge colonial affair. George Washington could have slept there every night. He was at Valley Forge and never seen the same room twice. A butler who talked like he was choking to death on an olive pit conducted me into the library and uh, into the presence of Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Oh, my. What a presence. She was sitting in front of the open fire, filling out a hostess gown that didn't straighten out any of the curves she featured. I pulled my eyes back into my head and tried not to look too interested. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I'm i in a bit of a hurry tonight, Mrs. Burgess. Uh, as a matter of fact, I... Mr. Rogue, I... my husband is making a fool of himself. Yes? He's lost his mind completely over a secretary in his office. His secretary. A girl by the name of Helen Stark. You you mean that... Yes, I mean he prefers her company to mine. Well, that doesn't sound reasonable, if you'll pardon me for saying so. What do you want me to do? Somebody has to bring Harvey back to his senses, Mr. Rogue. Well, I'm afraid you've called on the wrong man. I'm not very good at long fatherly talks. Oh, Mr. I... Rogue, please, I'm so alone. And... Hey, hey, now, wait a minute. Good grief. You mean to tell me that Harvey is neglecting you? What you need to straighten Harvey out is a psychiatrist, not a detective. Harvey is definitely off his trolley. Please help me, Mr. Rowe. No, 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 Mrs. Burgess. I, I... He's with her right this minute. How do you know? When he left the house tonight, I followed him. He went to the home of his best friend, Clarence Roman. I parked across the street. I was going in and faced them, but I saw Mr. Roman leave, and I lost my nerve. That's when I called you... Oh, Mr. Rogue, I want you to go out there and talk to Harvey. Tell him I know all about him and that Stark girl. I'm suing him for divorce. Well, that's not my kind of work, Mrs. Burgess. I'm sorry, but I... I don't want to divorce Harvey. But I do want him back. And I'm sure that if you will do as I say, he'll come back. You must do it for me, Mr. Rogue. Here. Oh, where is it? I have $500 here in an envelope. You did? Oh, wait a minute here. Let me see you. Oh, oh, is this it? Yes, that's your fee. Hmm. For going out there with me, Mr. Rogan. Trying to bring Harvey back to his senses. You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Well, I, uh... You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Okay, come along. All right. Well, it seems there's nobody home. There's my husband's convertible out in front, right where he left it tonight when I followed him out here. How did the girl arrive? In her car. 
Oh. Her car isn't here. It was right behind Harvey's. Looks like we got here too late, doesn't it? Try the door. I know Harvey's still here. All right. You're an old friend of Roman's, I suppose. Yes. Why? Uh, I just want to know before I try to open the door. You see, there are laws against that sort of thing. Hmm. Door's unlocked. Do we go in? Yes. Okay. After you. You know the house better than I do. Go ahead. All right. The living room is over here. Ah, oh, nobody home. Look, Mrs. Burgess, we better get out of here. No. I know Harvey's in this house someplace, and I'm going to find him. I can't... What are you sniffing for? Wait a minute. That smell in the air. You get it? What? Oh. I don't smell anything. You don't? I smell chloroform. Chloroform? Yeah. You take a look upstairs. I'm going to shake down the first floor. That smell of chloroform can mean trouble, you know. Mr. Rogue, what do you mean? You're frightening me. Mrs. Burgess was very fetching when she was frightened. But I calmed her down a little bit. Now, this may sound fantastic, but I've got a little bell in my head that rings an alarm every time I really get around serious trouble. And it was playing a tune that sounded too much like a death march right that minute. I had to get her out of the way. She finally went upstairs and I went to work. I took the living room first and looked behind all the couches and in all the dark corners. I was bending over, looking under a huge Italian carved table when I thought I heard a stealthy footstep behind me. Ah! Don't move. Oh! My ears were still full of that ringing scream Mrs. Burgess had let out as I caught that sock behind the ear and drifted gently through space toward cloud number eight and my alter ego, Hugo. I was hoping he wouldn't be there, but he was. Sitting there with that silly smirk on his face with his little short legs pulled up under his chin and his funny little arms around him and his long white beard waving the cosmic breeze. Oh, shut up. <laughs> That's a fine attitude. You go prowling around a strange house and get caught at it and knocked out. Then you come up here and take it out on me. <laughs> get out of here, you ingrate. Oh, stop acting like a landlord, Hugo. What happened to me? <laughs> Are you kidding? Tell me, why did Mrs. Burgess scream? Answer me, Hugo. Do you know why she screamed? Sure. You wanted to tell me? <laughs> no. Find out for yourself. <laughs> You're a detective. Oh, someday I'm going to get rid of you, you little pest. <laughs> Why don't you get back to work? You got a date with Liza, you know. She's still waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, here goes. Come on, Rogue. Please, come on. You didn't have to hit him so hard, Clarence. <coughs> oh, who hit me? I'm Clarence Roman, Rogue. I came home. I found the front door unlocked. I walked in. I saw a strange man prowling around my parlor. A woman screamed, and I hit you with my cane. Oh, well, what do you carry for a cane? A ball bat? Why did you scream, Mrs. Burgess? I found my husband upstairs. He's dead, murdered! <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now I'd like to say something to the ladies. Do you ever feel like hanging your head in shame because your hair isn't, well, looking as nice as it should? Perhaps you get discouraged because every time you shampoo your hair, it seems dry and difficult to set. Then for your next shampoo, why not try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo? This clear golden liquid shampoo is made from mild coconut and vegetable oils. These pure natural oils keep your hair from becoming dry and brittle. When you use Fitch's saponified shampoo, you can have a shampoo as often as you like, and after each one, your hair will be soft and lustrous, easy to set into your favorite hairstyle. You'll love the glorious quantities of fragrant lather this shampoo makes. 
It cleanses thoroughly and then rinses out completely without a special after rinse. You see, Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. All you do is rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent contained in the shampoo ensures the removal of all particles from your hair, making it sparkle with cleanliness. Ask for Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. Well, I had accepted a case for Mrs. Harvey Burgess, a suspicious wife. Yes, that's the Mrs. Harvey Burgess of the Burgess Millions. She suspected her husband of having a rendezvous with Helen Stark, his secretary, at the home of Clarence Roman, Burgess's best friend, and we went out there together. Nobody answered the door, so we went in. My suspicions were aroused when I smelled the unmistakable odor of chloroform. Mrs. Burgess was looking around upstairs while I searched the downstairs. Suddenly, I heard Mrs. Burgess scream. Ah! My husband! Upstairs, he's dead! Murdered! Well, that snapped me out of it. I got to my feet and ran up the stairs. Mrs. Burgess and Roma were right behind me, and she directed me into the library, which was just off the main hall. And there he was, as dead as last summer's romance, with a neat little blue hole right below the part in his hair. He was a nice-looking old guy, about 50, which made him a good 25 years older than his wife. And his widow was really taking his death big, which was natural. A woman doesn't have a husband murdered every day. Poor Harvey, this is horrible. Has anything in this room been moved or touched? Well, I just arrived home, when I When I looked wouldn't... in here and saw Harvey, I knew he was dead. I screamed. Yes, yes, I heard you. Then you ran right downstairs. Yes, huh? I, I saw Mr. Roman hit you, and I ran down to tell him who you were. And... That's a little late. Okay. Just don't touch anything. Stay right there in the door, both of you. Just who are you to be giving us orders? You'll find out. You ever see this gun before? Yes. Where? It was Harvey's. He kept it in his desk at the office. Ah, oh, you recognized it mighty quickly. How? It has his initials on it. I can see them from here, inset in the butt of the gun. Oh, his gun, huh? Yeah. Well, it wasn't suicide. Not with the gun clear over here on the opposite side of the room. This is murder. <laughs> hey, what's the matter? Well, this ought to do it. What is it? But your handkerchief. <laughs> A very nice linen handkerchief with initials in the corner. And blood on it. What initials? H.S. Helen Stark, that's her handkerchief. She killed Harvey. She killed my Harvey. Is there a phone upstairs here? Yes, you'll find an extension in the hall. Thanks. Come on out of this room. I don't want anything touched or moved. Now, now. Dear, please. You two wait for me downstairs. I'll be down just a minute. As soon as I call the police. Speaking. Hello, Urban. Richard Rogue. Yeah, who's dead? Harvey Burgess, wise guy. Hmm? You mean it? You mixed up in another murder, Rogie? Sure. You'd never find a body if it wasn't for me. Where are you? At the residence of Clarence Roman on Cypress Avenue, 2120. Better get the boys and get out here. Be right there. Got any leads on the killer? Uh, a couple of vague ideas. Stay there until I get there, Rogue. Oh, uh, hello, Liza, darling. This is Rogie. Oh, you know what time it is. Oh, sure, honey. I'll but give you I... ten minutes to get back here and take me to that show. What? Oh. Uh, look, Roman. <laughs> Roman, the cops will be here in a minute. Tell Urban, that's Lieutenant Urban. He'll be in charge for the police that I'll be right back, will you? Tell him I went out to get a murderess for him. Of course. And I hope you managed to catch her, Rogue. <laughs> Uh, 
Yes? Good evening. Is uh, Helen Stark at home? I, I, I beg your pardon. I'm, I'm a bit deaf. I, uh, I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, I said, is Helen Stark at home? Oh, oh, Helen? Uh, no, no, she isn't home this evening. Has she been home? I say, has she been home in the last hour? Uh, no, no, she hasn't. I, I don't know what time to expect her either. But I imagine she'll be home soon, though. You know where she is? Uh, well, she didn't come home from the office tonight. She's, she's working late. Oh, she called you and told you she wouldn't be home? Uh, yes, yes, she said she was going to work with Mr. Burgess. Uh, that's her boss, you know, the, the millionaire. Yes, uh, well, thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I tell her who called? No, 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 that, uh, that won't be necessary, thanks. Ah. Hmm? Thanks very much, Mr. Stark. I, uh, oh, uh, you and Helen live here all alone? Uh, yes, yes, since her mother died several years ago. Uh, are you an old friend of Helen's? No, a very recent acquaintance. Oh. I'm sorry I bothered you, Mr. Stark. Good night. Good evening. Nice out after the rain, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Good night. Good night. Oh, that nice little old guy. It was going to be tough for him to realize that his daughter was a killer. I hated the world as I walked down the steps from that porch and started for my car. I, uh... Oh, I don't like murder. It upsets so many people who aren't involved in the act. Or the reasons for it. Yeah, I guess I'm a chicken-hearted Patsy. But if I am, I'm glad. Anyway, I was walking down the walk when that little bell rang in my massive intellect again. I noticed something, something peculiar. There were tire tracks running into the stock garage. It had only stopped raining about 45 minutes before, and if that car had been driven into the garage while it was still raining, there would be no tracks. They would have been washed away. Now, very peculiar. I ran up the driveway and opened the overhead garage door. Then I jumped back. The garage was full of carbon monoxide. I wet my handkerchief in a puddle of rainwater, held it over my nose, and ran into the garage. I wrestled the door of the small coop open and saw a young girl, unconscious, slumped over the steering wheel. I pulled her out of there. She was dead weight and carried her into the house. Oh, Helen. Helen. I'm afraid it's a little late for that, Mr. Stark. Where's your telephone? In the hall. Right in the hall. Thanks. I'll get a pole motor squad out here right away. Fire department. Get a pole motor squad to 640 Inglewood Drive. Attempted suicide. Bad shape. Rush it. Right. Uh, 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 Raymond, Ramsey, Redding, Roman. Roman, Clarence. Lieutenant Urban, please. This is Richard Rogue, and it's important. This is Urban speaking, Rogue. I thought I told you to stay here. Look, never mind the arguments. Get out here to 640 Inglewood Drive. I've got Helen Stark for you. You have? Nice work. I want to talk to that young lady. Well, you missed the boat. I think she's dead. Suicide. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Step on it. Okay, Rogie. I'll be there in ten minutes. Don't go away. <laughs> I gave Helen Stark my own interpretation of artificial respiration until the pole motor squad got there. Urban arrived on the heels of the fire department, and we went out and looked around in the garage. Made some fascinating discoveries, too. The car had run out of gas and stopped turning over, for one thing. And one thing led to another, to coin a phrase. Anyway, Urban and I made a little deal. I went back to the Roman residence, and while he and his boys were being scientific, I sat in the parlor and talked with Mrs. Burgess and Clarence Roman. Mrs. Burgess had recovered her poise to some extent. They were both very anxious to know all about my daring capture of the Stark girl. I'm glad she's dead. I couldn't stand a trial. I'm glad she... 
committed suicide. Yes, I I guess it seemed like the only way out. She wasn't very smart about murder, leaving clues all over the place the way she did. <laughs> Even the cops would have had her in 24 hours. How well did you know the star girl, Roman? Rather well. I'd see her on the office a great deal. Harvey was, well, not very discreet about the fact that he was fond of her. Please, Clarence. Harvey's dead. We should forget those things. He was a good husband. I... I don't know what life is going to be like without him. I just have an idea that it's going to be pretty simple, Mrs. Burgess. And possibly rather short. What do you mean? I mean that the police suspect that you and Mr. Roman murdered your husband and Miss Stark. That's a serious accusation, Rogue. Your husband was suing you for divorce, wasn't he, Mrs. Burgess? He knew you were going to be there with Mr. Roman, his best friend tonight. So he came and surprised you with Helen Stark for a witness, didn't he? And you, Mr. Roman, you killed him and then you had to kill Helen Stark to shut her up. This is preposterous. Ah, uh, sit down, Roman. You were right, Rogie. We found Roman's fingerprints on the steering wheel of Helen Stark's car. One of the boys just got back with a report that Roman's shoe is a perfect fit in that shoe print outside Stark's garage. I had nothing to do with this. Clarence killed Harvey, and then he chloroformed that Stark girl, and then... You're in this as far as I am. Shut up! I've got more news for you, Roman. Helen Stark isn't dead. The car ran out of gas just in time. She'll be there to appear against you when you're tried for murder. <laughs> Liza, honey. I'm... I don't want to talk to you, Richard Rogue. I'm busy. Oh, now, honey. The lady says she's busy. Yeah? Who are you? His name is George. Good night, chump. Ah, little drops of rain. The stuff we're getting so much of out here in California right now saved Helen Stark's life. Because if I hadn't noticed those tire tracks... She would have stayed in the garage until it was too late for the pull motor squad to save her. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Little drops of rain put the curse on what was almost a perfect double murder. With the help of my massive intellect. There's only one thing I can't understand. How come a guy as smart as I am gets hit on the head so often? Answer me that, will you? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. How did you like our little story tonight? Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Oh, uh, don't forget to tune in next Thursday night. We're going to present a strange story of a house where everybody was scared. We call it the House of Fear. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, Barber, or Beauty Shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Folks, when we see a wounded veteran, we can thank him with our eyes and with a smile. We can also thank him in more material ways, like helping make sure he gets all the benefits of the G.I. Bill of Rights. That takes money. The money we lend when we buy victory bonds. Buy victory bonds. (laughs) 